Hello and welcome to the seven secrets that you can use to attract and keep a great, amazing, high quality man in a committed relationship in your life. Hello, my name is Matthew Coast, and today with me over here is Bex, Bex Burton, and we're going to be talking to you if you are currently, it doesn't really matter what kind of a situation you're in, whether you're in a situation where you're kind of frustrated and you're stuck and you're single and you haven't been able to get a date or you're um, maybe you're in a friend with benefits situation or some kind of casual situationship where you're trying to get a guy to commit to you or something like that. Anything where you are looking to get into a committed relationship that is what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm, I invited Bex here because I want her to share her story with you. If you're not familiar with Bex, she's actually one of our coaches. She's on our coaching team here. And I'm really, I really feel privileged and honored to have her as a part of our coaching team and working with us because she is a, uh, an amazing professional and she's kind of made um, the art and the science and the strategies of uh, attracting a great quality man into your love life, a major part and a major work of her life. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited for her to share her story. And, and she does this without you, uh, you know, trying to pretend like you're someone you're not or trying to like, you know, do a bunch of crazy, tricky things with a guy or something like that. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I've, uh, you know, looked at a lot of what she's done and as far as coaching and, and I'm really impressed with a lot of it and she's, she's great and awesome. And so thank you so much for being here with us today, Bex. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. What a, what a privilege and an honor to be here. Hello, everybody out there. It's so wonderful to have you. I'm very grateful for your time this morning. It's morning for me. It's evening for Matt. But uh, we're both so pleased to have you here. And um, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and a little bit about my journey to love and how I got to this position of supporting you in your love life. Um, and then Matt and I will kind of volley back and forth and, and pick out some of these uh, these secrets, seven secrets that we've identified that um, have supported me along my path in attracting and growing the relationship with my husband and the the secrets that he and I both, that Matt and I both share with the women that we work with, both in the Commitment Connection in all the course videos and all the, the forum that you guys uh, interact with if you're in the Commitment Connection um, courses, you get the access to the forum and that's where you see me. Hi, I'm the one, uh, me and coach Cleo answering all your questions. And, um, yeah, it's been a journey. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. So I'm Bex Burton. I am a love and relationship coach, and I'm also an avid mover, a dedicated wife and a huge animal lover. And I'm also a Leo. I just celebrated my birthday last week. And that just means that I'm a not so closeted showgirl. If there's an opportunity for me to dress up and, you know, go out dancing or something, I'm I'm all for it. Parades, you know, roller skate dance parties, I'm I'm all for it. Um, joy is one of my primary uh, core values in life. And uh, this summer, actually in June, my husband and I uh, just celebrated our 10 year anniversary of falling in love with each other. And this winter, thank you. Yeah, this in December will be our seventh uh, seventh anniversary of marriage, and yeah, the, I'm like, I will take all of the congratulations because honestly, um, you know, for somebody whose track record was a, a, a you know all of my relationships ended at the two year mark up until that point in my life, and so this just feels like a, a tremendous milestone and celebration to share. And, you know, you, you may be surprised to hear that love and relationships was a pain point in my life, was a challenge for me up until, um, you know, up until it wasn't, obviously. Um, and and it I got to say, though, <laughs> I'm just going to put the, the realness in there is that, you know, once you attract your person, that that doesn't mean that all the all of the the learning and the lessons and the growth ends um, and, and that we enter into the happily ever after. I, I truly believe that that's where our our, our deepest learning occurs. So I will 
be the first person to say that I continue to be on a learning curve in my own love life, in my own love and relationship. Um, and I do believe that because of that, because of uh, being a, a committed lifelong learner and student of love and, and relationship, that I, I have this 10 year lasting uh, loving relationship. So um, a little bit more about me uh, in my, my early years, I grew up as an overweight kid. I did not get the attention from boys that some of my other classmates did. And, you know, that was really painful, but it certainly didn't stop me from trying. Um, I would be the first person to start up a conversation or try to sit next to a boy in class and like, you know, get really close to him. And bottom line, in the relationships in my my early days, in my early 20s and 30s were, were never really by design, but rather a product of my chasing or convincing somebody to be in a relationship with me. Um, I think I even like convinced my prom date to go. I was thinking about that this morning, like my senior prom date. I think I actually convinced him to uh, to to be a guest at my my prom. Um, you know, and then other relationships of just going with the flow because it just made sense or it was convenient. And you know, it's not surprising that these relationships didn't really survive much more than a couple of months or a couple of years. And in each relationship, consciously or not, little by little, I was sacrificing parts of myself in order to make my partner, my boyfriend feel more comfortable or to fit myself into his life. So I never felt like I could just be myself. Like these relationships never really truly felt aligned. There was always some way that I was giving away my power or sacrificing myself. And after a while, I felt like I was just too much. I was just too wild or too creative, too independent or too whatever to sustain a long-term relationship. And so that developed into this either or situation, this belief that kept being reinforced in my life that I either could be in a relationship and be a fraction of myself, or I could be fully me and just not worry about or not bother with relationship at all. And this is an example of black and white thinking, right? That there's just no in between. And I was really caught in that pattern. And I, I know that a lot of you can get into these, these thought traps, these thought distortions. Yeah. I just, yeah. I just want to throw something in there real quick, Bex. Please um, do. I, there, there's a lot of women saying hi and different things in the chat. Um, and if you, if you can kind of relate to this idea of feeling like, you either have to jump on one side or the other, right? You either have to pretend like you're somebody you're not, or you have to, um, or, or you have to be single, right? If, if you can kind of relate to that idea at all, just say yes in the chat, just let us know. So, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I can, I can even relate, <laughs> relate to that. Back, so, yeah. Uh, and I, and I hear that a lot, you know, I hear that a lot, especially in our community. A lot of women are just like, you know, they're, they're frustrated, they're tired. They're like, you know, is this even possible for me? Do I have, why do I have to, you know, twist myself into a pretzel? Right. And, you know, if I'm just going to lay it out on the table and show up in a full authenticity, you know, that, that feeling does come up again. And it, it's not like it completely goes away, but I think that for me and my experience and, and what we do here in commitment connection and, and the work we do with clients is that we, we give you the tools so that it doesn't have to feel like a sacrifice. You you get to learn like how you're feeling when your needs are not met. You get to learn that you have you get to have needs <laughs> and that you get to have those needs expressed and requested. You get to uh, have conversations about what makes relationship work for you. And these are the things that that help um, you know find that gray area in between like effort. I just can't be in relationship at all, or I really do want partnership, but I just can't be myself full out. And if you have anything to add, Matt, you're always welcome to jump in, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's one of those things where it's like everybody, uh, even on the men's dating side, like that's one of the most common complaints that I hear from men as well as they're like, they're like, why can't, 
women just like me for me? Why do I have to play this game? Why do I have to, you know, develop all that? I feel like I'm a dancing monkey when I'm in front of women because I got to be like, I got to be shucking and jiving, you know, <laughs> convincing this girl that they want to hang out with me, you know, sending right. all these crazy text messages, right? And it's like, they feel like it's going nowhere. So yeah, I mean, right. I mean, it's a very, very relatable thing. <laughs> on yeah, every side. yeah on every definitely. Side. So in, in my journey, there was this period of time where I felt like I was, you know, I was really available and open and present to men that weren't giving me the time of day, that didn't even know that I existed or that I was alive. I'm chasing them down. And finally, after my, it was, I, I had basically the same breakup um, for the third time in the span of 10 years. That was that was pretty much my wake up call because this breakup was with three very different men, but the 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 feeling the energy of the breakup was exactly the same, and that was the experience that had me realize that wow I'm the common denominator in this situation, and that I'm kind of causing or I'm, I'm not, may not be causing but I'm the source of the heartache here like I'm I'm you know spend all this time projecting my blame outward but you know it's time to take some responsibility, so. It was at that time that I decided to to start figuring this love stuff out. And I started reading books and listening. Well, there weren't a whole lot of podcasts back then, but reading lots of books, um, you know, and the language that I was using was that, like, I better fix myself before I inflict this pain on anybody else, before I, you know, before I hurt another unsuspecting victim. That was literally the way that I thought of my behavior at that time, once I kind of woke up to, to how I was contributing to the situation. So I felt really bad. I'm a self punisher from way back. And um, I decided that the best course of action for me was to date myself for longer than my longest relationship, which at the time was like two years. So it wouldn't have been that very long. Um, but the point of all of that is that what, what really ended up happening from that promise to myself and that experience was that I prioritized deepening the relationship with myself over trying to find a relationship externally with a, with a man, with a partner, with a boyfriend. And so, you know, it wasn't that I was celibate and it wasn't that I was like not dating. In fact, that's actually when I swung my pendulum to the opposite end. And I started dating in the abundance practice that Matt teaches about in the Commitment Connection and all the programs. And, you know, I started dating for fun and for information gathering and to like and, and, and for myself to decide, like, does this is this does this feel good? Am I satisfied with this person, with this candidate presenting himself in front of me? Um, you know, and it was around the same time that um, I attracted another guy into my life and we came together kind of casually just because I was in this casual, abundant thing. And um, of course, as we do women, you know, we start developing feelings, especially after we get intimate with somebody. So I, you know, I started developing feelings for him and I wasn't really quite sure what was happening, but um, I did express to him that I was I was interested in seeing where this was you know, going to go. And bottom line, I, you know, I invited him to be my date at a couple of different weddings, a couple of events. And he turned me down like left and right and left and right. I'm like, well, what the heck are we doing here? And so, you know, and I, 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 I probably confronted him. I was less skillful back in the day than I am today. Um, but as it turned out, you know, I, I realized that he was perfectly content with the way things were. You know, we'd get together on the weekends for a Friday night adventure or Sunday brunch. You know, we'd have some sexy time and it was very casual, very satisfying and great and connected while we were together. And I would say all the same things that I hear you ladies say. We had great chemistry. We have such a good time. We have endless conversations, you know, but then there's that in between time where it's crickets and, you know, I, and I, I'm in this position of starting to re recognize like, wow, I'm really giving so much of myself. What am I getting in return? Um, so I, you know, that was, that was probably the first actual um, grounded and aligned breakup that I've ever, that I ever had because I, I realized, wow, like you're not the problem. There is no problem 
we're just not aligned in what we want. That doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make like, it was so revolutionary. And so that was where I began this process, this understanding of release with blessing. Like it's, it's totally cool that that's what you want. And it's totally cool that this is what I want. And it's okay that what I want has changed. That was the big thing was understanding, taking responsibility that, oh, I entered into this agreement casually. And what I realized is that I really want something integrated and long lasting. So this is where having a clear vision is so important, you know, because if we're not clear on what we're calling in, then we are going to call in randomness and chaos and and these these less than spectacular experience experiences that are going to leave us disappointed because we're not being true and honest to our, with ourselves of what what we actually want. Well, and, and I like I like this concept of agreement that you're talking about here. Um, and I talk about it in terms of like commitment and being in a relationship. But you're talking about the agreement of kind of this casual thing that's going on. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I, you could probably even take it further and start talking about the agreement that you have with yourself, you know, <laughs> and yeah. it's, uh, but, but I, I think it's a really, really important concept in a lot of women. Um, they, they're so, at least in our community recently, and I've been, you know, I go through the community every day and just look at what women are saying and all that kind of stuff. And I saw this post today. Uh, where this woman was like really, really frustrated because she'd been seeing this guy for a long time. And, it, you know, she just the she was like, aren't we in a relationship? Shouldn't we be in a relationship? And it's like, you know, what's the agreement that you have? You know, is there an yeah. agreement? Is there an unspoken agreement? Is there an right. open agreement? Right. And if you don't have one at all, you don't know what it is. You know, you're just letting whatever happen happen. And. Uh, it might not be what you want, you know, and that's why it's important yeah. to find out whether there's an alignment or not. Um, and, you know, instead of just trying to guess and hope and look for clues and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Operate on assumptions and, right. you know, asking our friends and asking the coach, what does he, what does he mean when we say, you know, when he says <laughs> this, <laughs> like ask him, it's a perfect <laughs> opportunity to connect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it is challenging because, you know, we, we have this fear that we're going to turn somebody off. We're going to push somebody or we're going to wreck it. We're going to ruin everything. And, you know, what I've come to understand with working with as many women that I have and, and in my own journey is, I mean, I feel bold saying this, but we can't screw it up with the right guy. I mean, out of the gate, I don't know. I just, I feel like if, if there is that, that alignment, then, you know, a faulty text message, or you know a a, a a a reaction that's over the top, you know, is, isn't isn't something that can completely break something if there is alignment and connection there, and if we have the wherewithal to take responsibility for how we're showing up. So there's a little caveat there, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't want to be abusive and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Like, I don't know, I was ignoring him. I locked him in the closet. <laughs> I was beating him. He kept screaming. I thought, you know, you can't screw things up with the wrong, with the right, right. person. <laughs> right. Some caveats there. So um, I duct taped him to the chair. Um, yeah. So that casual thing was a huge wake up call for me. And, and it was really interesting because that break, that release with blessing, really propelled me deeper into my love attraction work, my love, uh, my understanding of love and relationship. And, you know, this is when I created my vision and, and I almost forgot about it. And I think that this is also something that's really important is that we give our vision space, you know, we're not like attacking it 24 seven, but like we give it some space and turn our focus back to ourselves. You know, in that period of time, after I wrote my vision, I got clear, I released this guy, you know, I went right back into my relationship with myself and being the very best self that I could be. I produced some of my greatest artwork in that period of time. And like some of those days leading up to attract, well, what happened next was I attracted the man who's now my husband. And so all of that is to say is that, you know, we get clear, we release what doesn't serve us. We go back into ourselves and really nourish 
like our, our inner being, that which lights us up, the thing that makes us shine and, and, and feel most whole and grounded in the world. And that's the energy that attracts lasting love. That's the energy that turns heads when you walk into a room. Um, and I will say, I'll just come back around just to kind of complete the story once again, that once you find that special guy, and again, like I, I, I met that special guy, the alignment was off the charts. We had more in common. I mean, I could go on and on, but it was, it was like one of those fair, I, I don't want to call it a fairy tale, but there was a lot of synchronicity that, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I believe in signs and symbols for the from the universe. And there was just so much synchronicity that I was really leaning into and paying attention to and receiving um, that just, it, it felt super special. And that, that synchronicity continues to happen in our relationship. Um, but again, it's not all cake and rainbows. Once you find the person that is in alignment, that shares the same vision, that commits to lifetime or, or whatever mutual partnership you, you have a, an arrangement for or an idea of, um, you know, all of the stuff is still circling in our system. And this is why coaching and other professional services are so important, not only to attract our lasting love, but also to keep it, to grow and nourish the relationship so that when our old fears and our old patterns and our old belief systems start popping up, you know, the first time Nick and I experienced conflict, you bet I wanted to flip the table and run and be like, peace, this is too much. This is I didn't sign up for this. You know, where's my fairy tale romance? Where's my happily ever after? Well, <laughs> I didn't flip the table and run. Instead, you know, because there is a point where I believe that we come to, you know, the pain of flipping the table and leaving. The that pain surpasses the the anticipated pain of just looking at our blocks and and facing them and and healing them. You know, we find somebody that is special enough that that work is less painful than leaving. So, you know, diving head on into that work, I learned about having needs, being, uh, you know, having codependent tendencies and giving away my power and how I have showed up in relationship over and over again, and how to, how to really stand as a sovereign being in relationship, understand my needs, understand my desires, understand that they're okay, and how to communicate them in a way that is connecting instead of emasculating, you know, instead of, you know, in, in a way that evokes uh, desire and connection for my husband instead of making him feel like garbage or like he's my child or something, you know. And at the same time, I have a partner who's committed to doing the same work himself. And I didn't know that that was a priority for me when I was calling in my partner, but man, I, you know, if I were ever in this position again, I am so blessed to have somebody who takes responsibility for his part in our, you know, misalignments and our disagreements and our conflict because it happens, you know, and I'm going to be the first one to like just throw out the misbelief that it's not going to happen in the perfect relationship. Because even if you come together with all the signs and symbols from the universe, you're still two individual human beings having an organic animal experience with a, a rational brain and an irrational brain with, you know, years and years of history that you bring to the table. So there's just so much, um, grace and compassion that that goes into like the tool belt of attracting and keeping lasting love so with that matt whatever wherever you want to take it from here if you have questions yeah, i i me. totally <laughs> i totally agree with everything you just said and uh i you know one of the things that i talk about a lot is that in my opinion the most important thing that you can look for in a partner is somebody that's growth oriented because if they are growing, then you guys can grow together somewhere. Right. But if they're in one spot and they're trying to stay in that spot forever, right. It's, it's really, really difficult, but that also kind of means that you need to be growth oriented. Although if you're here, you're probably growth oriented. So <laughs> thanks for being here. And I, I'm just, so let's just jump into these seven secrets real quick. And then um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and ask a question in the chat and uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end here that we will get to the uh, question. So, um, so number one, number one secret Debbie's like, uh, 
or Diane's like, are you going to share the seven secrets? She's like, I'm impatient. Give me the seven secrets. I'm about, they're here for you, Diane. I'm, I'm, we're telling you right now. So number okay. one, number one is the women most magnetic to love are those who live their own lives fully and authentically. So what do you have to say about that? I'm going to re reiterate that in the chat for everybody in the back. Oh, um, yeah, the women who are most magnetic to love are those who live their lives fully and authentically. Um, what do I have to say about that? I, I feel like the magnetism that is attractive to to men. Okay, let's let's talk about men and women. When women are living according to their own code, their own core values, their own um, desires and pleasure. We're talking. We're getting a little bit into feminine energy here, um, but these these women have a, a special energy. They radiate a special energy that women who are seeking to align themselves with what men want don't. So let me let me simplify this. Women who are looking internally, looking to themselves for fulfillment for joy, for love, for satisfaction are the most magnetic to love versus women who are looking externally to their career, to partnership, to their bank account, to their Instagram following. Those women are always going to be dissatisfied because those markers, the, those are always moving targets. You know, you, you reach a certain income level, you reach a certain status in your career and there's always something more, right? And so when a woman is in that space of, and, and this is not to say that she can't be desirous of growing her life and calling in more abundance and, you know, but there's a difference than that, than like finding her worth and measuring her worth against her external measures, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That's a very interesting way to explain it there, Bex. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say it in kind of a different way. And Please do. Um, uh, so the way that I kind of, and you know, you mentioned feminine energy there. And, and one of the things that we get all the time is women are like, Oh, is this feminine? Like if you send him a text message, that's not feminine. Right. And it's like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, it's not feminine energy has nothing to do with what you're doing. Right. It's it's actually an internal state. It's like an energy that you have in yourself. You a lot of times we'll look at behaviors and we'll be like, oh, you know, that behavior, if you're doing this and you're doing that, you're probably in your masculine energy. Right. Because you're trying to make things happen. You're like doing all this stuff. And that's and a lot of women kind of mistake that where they're like, OK, well, if I'm going to be in feminine, I have to, you know, do this this many times and do that that many times. And you're like totally in your head overthinking it. Right. And really what it is, is, uh, you know, at the core, because what they found in research is that around 80 percent of women are actually feminine in their core. And so what feminine energy really is, is about getting authentic. It's about connecting with yourself. It's about coming from this place of you and expressing you, which can be a really confusing. It's, it's a really kind of a difficult concept to explain and talk about because there's so like it's one, it's so esoteric and two, because there's so many things that might be in your way. Right. A lot of times women come to me and they're like, well, I don't want to change who I am. And I, you know, I just want to be me. Right. And a lot of times they're not being them. Right. And they don't even know that they're not being them because they have all this programming from childhood and from society and from their friends and their family and all these different things that are actually determining their behavior, their habits, you know, that they've had because they, you know, they felt like they're abandoned when they're a kid. And so, you know, now they've decided that they're all alone in the world. And so they've developed this tough outer shell and, and they've been doing it for so long that they think that's who they are. And that's not actually who you are. That's something that you've picked up along the way. And so a lot of this work is actually about breaking that open and going, okay, you know, if, if I got rid of this shell that I've developed and these habits that I've created as a result of 
you know, all of my trauma and stuff from my past, you know, who would I actually be? How would I actually live life? How would I actually express and connect and all these different things? And what most people find when they do that is that their life isn't this, you know, methodical, you know, break things down and, you know, make things happen kind of a thing, but it's this expression. It's this beautiful journey of dancing and singing and playing and, you know, connecting and just being together and like all this stuff. And it's, um, it's a really, really beautiful thing. And you can usually tell when people aren't in that, at least that in the moment, because they're doing all this stuff to make certain things happen. And it's, that's not, you know, that's not what, what, is coming. That's not what authenticity looks like. Right. And when you are coming from your authenticity, it's so rare in this world at this point that it's like, you know, you see somebody doing it and you're just, you're in awe, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. (laughs) It's amazing. It's gorgeous. And to a guy, when a guy experiences that, it's like, it's like, I don't know what's going on with her, but I just want to like grab her and (laughs) hug her and run off with her because she's so amazing, you know, just kiss her all over and just run, you know, I don't believe he wants to be with me too, you know? And, and so, um, so yeah, I, that's another way to talk about yeah, that. So I love that. Um, <laughs> well, there's a lot uh, of overlap jump, there. There's yeah. Let's, overlap let's, there. Uh, let's jump into number two here. So the, the more levity and non-attachment you bring, you bring to your mm-hmm. dating practice, the better. So date for data versus relationship status. So yeah. let's talk about that. Yeah, sure. I I can kick that off. Oh, yeah. A lot of women that I speak with are in their, not even dating life, but in their uh, just everyday life in this, are you my husband? Energy. I call it the energy of, are you my husband? Are you my husband? Are you my husband? And (laughs) it's... there's, there's nothing wrong with being goal oriented, right? We, you're, you're, you're in this, you're on this webinar, you're in this process for the, the, the purpose of attracting partnership. At the same time, it's a journey. It's a process of getting there. And if, you know, if, if you were, you were given everything that you wanted in, in your entire life, all in one fell swoop, like you'd be overwhelmed. You wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, but not only that, like the, the process of, meeting and engaging with new men operate, it it benefits you in so many different ways. First of all, it helps you get clearer and fine tune that vision that you have, because we can't create a vision in a vacuum. We create our vision based on our past experience, what we liked, what we didn't like from our past relationships. And so as you continue to date, I have a client right now who is looking for long-term relational, relational partnership, and she's dating, um, a couple of different men. She's dating one man, like mostly, who's giving her a lot of like emotional connection and physical touch. But then she just went out on a date yesterday that, you know, he wasn't very connected in that way. But man, did he have a plan? And he like held the space for her in a container and like guided her and just, you know, created this experience for her. And the point of sharing that story is that what she's realizing is that, okay, maybe these elements aren't coming all together in one man right now, but she's understanding that, oh, this emotional and physical touch piece is really meaningful for me. And wow, I didn't realize that I, that I really value a man with a, with a plan and structure until I went out on this date with this guy, you know, and it's like, she's not going to see that guy ever again. Like she isn't really interested in, in like, you know, seeing where that goes, but man, the richness of what she got from him, was was enough like that's why she had that date it wasn't because he's her future husband but it's because wow he had something so concrete and like solid in himself to share with her for her to understand wow that's really lovely i'm going to add that to my vision so the whole the whole idea of dating for practice dating for for well that's the whole idea of dating for data is that we're getting new elements of the vision dating for practice is you know like being able to to sit with somebody else and i mean for for anyone with codependent tendencies which is a lot of women i got to say is to sit across from somebody and be able to discern like what are what do what do i like versus what do i what am i thinking that you're going to like like how do i practice 
coming back to myself and coming back to how I feel in this moment and what feels good to me in this moment, instead of like practicing, you know, what we might do by default, like trying to be something or trying to act a certain way. So dating for practice is you have these multiple opportunities to practice coming back to yourself and and coming back to how does this align with my vision versus does he like me is this going to work out is he my future husband so that's that's my take on dating for data and dating for practice matt what about you it's good it's good um well i you know i like what you said and we have a lot here so i think we're just going to jump into number three real quick. <laughs> sure. Sure. i feel like i don't want to like make this you know like a super long um event here so let's talk about number three which is learning to communicate your feelings needs and desires in a direct and straightforward way and and, and this is a huge one right this is I mean, all of these are huge, right? It's like foundational, important, huge, right? I mean, we, we can just go over, um, uh, you know, I, I could say that really for any of them, but you know, this is, this is such a big thing because it's, it's one of the things that I've been talking about a lot recently with a lot of women because they're, uh, you know, it, it's like they've been putting off their own needs and their own desires and what they want. And they're just hoping that guys are going to figure out what it is and what, you know, what they should be doing. And then they get really upset and frustrated because the guys aren't doing what it is that they want the guys to be doing. And so, you know, they, uh, you might've heard it before, but communication is the most important thing in a relationship, right? It's probably, in my opinion, I think it's the most important thing in life. And it's one of those things just, you know, uh, part of this is really just about believing that you deserve it, right? Believing that you deserve what it is that you want and making, you know, and having your needs met and all, all that kind of stuff. Because if you are coming from a place where deep down, even if you, you know, you, you think you believe you deserve it and all that kind of stuff, if deep down, you really are just like, you think that, you know, you should, you should just take whatever you're going to get and that that's what you deserve, then you're not going to take a stand. You're not going to take a stand for what you want. You're not going to communicate what you want because you're going to be afraid that the guy's going to run off on you and that he's not going to love you and that, you know, all kinds of bad things might happen. And they could, right? It could happen, right? Bad things could happen. He could leave. He could decide that you're not the right person for him or whatever because he wants to, you know, bulldoze he wants a doormat to work with right and that's okay right because that means that you're opening a, up a space where you can actually get what it is that you do want and that you're not going to be stuck in this situation any longer where you're not getting what it is that you want and you are just being kind of walked all over do you have any thoughts on that bex I mean, I know you have thoughts on that. <laughs> Do I have thoughts? <laughs> um, well, I completely agree with you about communication being primary, not only in relational relation, like romantic relation, all relationships are based on communication. And, you know, I think that this is one of the things that you do really well in you know the course videos and we work a lot with women in the forum around is how to communicate because we you know we get women asking us you know like i've been dating this guy for three months and everything has been going so great and you know he used to text me every day and now it's been four days and i haven't heard from him what's good what did i do wrong you know and it's <laughs> understandably that kind of situation can cause you know fear in our hearts but at the same time like there's so many different possibilities and if we can stay rational and grounded for a moment and say okay well how am i feeling i'm feeling anxious i'm feeling disconnected i'm feeling lonely maybe that's it i'm just feeling lonely great if we can identify how how we're feeling and what we want i'd really love to hear from you um i miss you um, or, you know, just different, different ways of, of expressing exactly what the desire is. I'd really love to see you this weekend, you know, um, because again, a, a man doesn't, doesn't have Intel into our minds, you know, and, and there's so much of our, um, I think conflict and, and misunderstanding comes from when we're operating on assumption and we're not being clear and direct. 
And the thing about sharing our feelings, sharing like the our, our direct needs and desires is really scary. It's so scary sometimes. But the magic of it is that when we can be that vulnerable with the right person, it's very connecting and creates a level of intimacy that is not created when we're operating on assumption. So we want to look out for how the other person responds to our requests. We want to look out for how we how we voice our requests. There are you know there are frameworks for this that help create connection that we offer in in the videos and in the forum and, and such. So be on be on the lookout for that. But um, yeah, communication is is so key. We can't just assume. Absolutely, can't assume. Don't assume. Stop assuming. Talk about it. All right, number four. <laughs> Number four is discovering your own ch early childhood programming and how it impacts your adult relationships. They say that we, uh, you know, in your, your childhood, you get like, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's like 90% of all of your like programming for, you know, how you're going to live your life and what you're going to do for the rest of your life in your, in your childhood. Right. <laughs> and so by the time you're an adult, most of, the things that you're going to be wired with, with your belief systems and who you think you are and what you think you deserve and all that kind of stuff is already in there and it's already set. And the longer you go with that set, the more you start thinking that that's who you are. You start identifying with it. You start, uh, you know, you're attached to it, you know, like people get attached to this, these different feelings, right? The feeling of being a victim is a very mm -hmm. addictive feeling. Right. Because you're you get attention from it. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, it was that my life was so hard. And people are like, yeah, your life was really hard. Right. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it was. Right. And and you start getting you feel like you get some like uh, connection with it. But then you sacrifice the love that you end up wanting to have because you stay in that victim state for a long time. Right. And, and I, you know, we've all been there. And so it's um, I, I think I mean, this is. Uh, in my opinion, a lifelong thing. I mean, should I say this again? This is one of the most important things that you <laughs> that you can do. Oh, God. The, go ahead, Bex. Go ahead. I'm just going to keep saying that. <laughs> You're just going to tell us it's important. <laughs> it's important. This is so important. It is. I mean, the, all these seven. I mean, you know, these are all important. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll be I'll be brief here, but you know, I, I on this webinar already, I've claimed you know my my people pleasing tendencies. You know, I could I could run through. I won't. I'll spare you. But you know, the the point of doing this this research into our our programming and our psyche and and you know is not to um, identify with it or to like really like hold on to it. You know, as Matt was saying, because that it, it can be addictive. But to to just help us understand our tendencies and our impulses uh, by default of and how they show up in relationship. So, you know, I've mentioned that, you know, I, I have people pleasing tendencies and that came from early childhood. How that shows up in my relationship is that, you know, I have a default pattern to look to my partner for leadership or for like, what are we doing today? Or, you know, just before I even check in with myself or what I need, you know? And so for me to understand that, I can then put practices into place in my day throughout my life that help me prioritize myself, the relationship with myself so that I'm combating that, that tendency to give away my power and like, you know, let my man run the show 24 seven, which is, you know, that's not going to work because I have ideas and opinions too. Um, so again, it's not to, 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 to identify and like glom onto this and, and, and like make an excuse. Well, I'm a people pleaser. So you do all, you know, it's, it's again, to help us mitigate those, those challenges so that we can have the relationship that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you, what do you do that's stopping you from, you know, uh, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, making sure that you're communicating what it is that you want, making sure that you're connecting with your man in a way that he wants, you know, and, and a lot of times our childhood stuff is stopping us from, from, you know, taking care of ourselves, from connecting with other people, from, uh, you know, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, you know, you go on and on and on. This is <laughs> it's such a huge topic. 
But yeah. we're moving on to number five. And number five is if a man tells you he can't meet your desires, right? He doesn't want, he's not ready for a relationship. <laughs> he's telling you the truth, right? You believe him. You believe what he's talking about. You you listen to him. And, and I totally get this, right? And this it's a really, really common one because you most people hate dating, right? Dating is not a thing that most people want to do. They want to go from being single to being in a relationship and it being done. Right. Yeah. And so that's what most people try to do, men and women, is they're like, OK, well, how do I skip the dating phase? And so they're like, OK, um, that guy. Right. He seems to like me and he's really cute and awesome. He's it. Right. And then they bring that guy over and they're like, OK, well, he's great, except for this and for that. And he never wants to get married and he doesn't want to have kids. And I do. And he does, you know, and he's got this smoking habit, you know, and he, you know, has these, uh, you know, weird fetishes and stuff that kind of make me really question all of life and reality <laughs> and men and, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> whether, whether humanity should even exist on this planet anymore. And, you know what I mean? Like, let me, let me go to Matt and ask Matt how I can fix this guy. Right. <laughs> and then they come to me and I'm like, I'm like, so he said that he absolutely does not want a relationship. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, and they're like, but he, but he acts like he does. And I'm like, when words and behaviors are out of alignment, always believe the worst of the two whatever it is, right? If he, if he says that he doesn't want a relationship, but he acts like he wants a relationship, believe the worst one, which is he said he doesn't want it, right? If he says that he wants a relationship, but he doesn't act like he wants a relationship, believe his actions, right? Actions speak louder than words sometimes, but sometimes words speak louder than actions. And you have to know which one is, you know, in the situation, what's going on there. And so, um, yeah, did you want, did you want to say something about this, Bex? I think you got that one. This is one of my favorite ones, though. <laughs> it's one of your favorite <laughs> ones. It's one of my least favorite ones because <laughs> I hear it so much. Um, but yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite ones because it was such a game changer for me when my Mr. 80%, I call him is 80% because he was, you know, 80% perfect. Right. Uh, perfect. You know, and, and he just was very matter of fact about it. And it was like, I don't know, for the first time in my life, I could hear that neutrally and be like, oh great. Thank you. You know, and, and, and we, we're not always able to hear that so neutrally, obviously when we're more attached and such, but I was in a place and it, it changed my life. So six, number six, moving on to number six, which is you're better off solo than staying in a situation ship, wishing, hoping, praying that it's going to turn into something different. And I mean, does that yeah. even need to be explained? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, it's, it's yeah. yeah. I mean, I, we get it so much that it's almost like, you know, it's just like, yeah, I, you want it to be something that it's not, but it's yeah. not, but it's not, you know, it, it, and it is. really piggybacks on the one that we just talked about, about if a man says that he's not re ready, willing, available for a relationship, you know, that that's a clear marker. This also goes back to the communication piece and like getting clear, like, you know, making sure that you both have an understanding of, of what you're looking for, what your definition of relationship is in the first place. Um, yeah, because if, if there isn't alignment, then, then unless, I mean, I, I guess the only caveat to that, you're better off solo than staying in a situation ship, wishing it would be or turn into something different. Yes, but if you are in a, in something where you're gaining information and you're still learning from that person, there's value. But as soon as you're wishing that it was something different or that person would be different and you've communicated those needs and it's not happening, yeah, that's the time to move on. It is. It's the time to move on. It's a sad, sad time, but you got to move on. Just give him a blessing. Tell him you're going to be on your way. Just you're calling move that. on. Just move, you totally you're move calling. on. All right, number seven is relationship is a – wait, no. Did we already said that. You got it. No. Relationship is a practice versus a transaction. <laughs> So are we talking about um, uh, in the relationship here, Bex? 
Uh, I'd say that I'd say that love attraction and relationship is a practice because again, once you're in relationship, is there a ceasing of love attraction? I mean, are we, are we like ceasing to attract the other person? I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like relational experience is a practice versus a transaction where you do something for me and I'll return the favor. I mean, that might be, you know, at the market, but in, in relationship, even if you're, you're calling somebody in, you're dating it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the practice there is again, like coming back to the relationship with yourself, checking in with your vision, how you feel, what you need, and, and also practicing all of these things that we've been talking about, practicing, communicating those needs and desires to the other person, whether it's, whether you haven't even gotten off the, the dating app or you're in a 10 year relationship, you know, communicating your, your needs and desires is so foundational. So relationship being a practice. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a, a, an everyday commitment. Um, even, even if you're in your love attraction process, you're, you're, you're dating, or maybe you're in the he dating hesitancy phase where you're like, I want to be in that relationship, but don't want to date. Like that's a practice too, of, of, you know, how you're engaging with the idea of calling in a partner with the, your relationship with dating. Like what stories are you making up about that? You know, that's a practice right there of like dismantling those stories, those assumptions, those fears, addressing them head on, um, you know, instead of like uh, the, the, the transaction version of that would be, uh, you know, I, I need a text message to fix my relationship. <laughs> that's very transactional, right? Like there's one thing that's going to make everything smooth and feel good, but that's it's so not true. It's like, I mean, I, you know, I always equate it to, you know, getting fit and going to the gym. Like we don't go once and, you know, pump a couple of bicep curls and magically have this transformed body. I mean, it's a, a series of repetition and commitment and and failure, like falling down. We don't go to the gym every day, right? There's days where it's like, man, you hit snooze. But then there's the opportunity to get back up and recommit and, you know, show back up again and again and again. And that's that's how I see relationship as a practice. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'd like to say about that too, is it, you know, it relationship is a practice versus a destination as well. Cause that's yeah. one. I had a mentor. I have a mentor who often tells me, uh, if you do what you did, if you do in the middle of a relationship, what you did at the beginning, there won't be an end. And mm -hmm. one of the problems that a lot of people have is they jump mm -hmm. into a relationship and they're like, ah, I'm here. I'm in my relationship. It's done. Right. Like it's all over. Right. Men and women do this both. Right. Men are notorious for doing this, but a lot of women do it as well. Right. Where they and it's usually for men, it's relationship and women, it's usually more marriage. Right. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I did all these things to get there and now I'm here and it's just like, Oh, I'm just going to stop doing everything completely. Right. And, and um, if you look at the couples that are the most successful, been together for 70 years, that kind of thing, uh, you, you notice that they have some very similar things in common. It's, you know, they, they, you see them and they still tease each other. They still flirt with each other. They still hold hands with each other. You know, they still tickle each other. They still, you know, mess with each other. They still have fun with each other. They still play with each other, you know, and that's, that's, that's what love is, right? It's, it's being playful and fun. It's connection. It's, it's, you know, it's not this seriousness. It's not like, oh, I've done it now it's over. You know, you know, everything should be fine now. Right. No, it's just, it's a practice, right? It's a daily practice. Not even say that everything's kind of a daily uh, a practice, right? Long-term consistency yeah. is what, gets you any yeah. kind of result that you want in anything in life period. Yeah. And 